Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including James C. Smith, Miranda Janelle, and Justin Zellers. Coming up on DTNS, should Apple make Siri easier to activate? Why Airbnb price transparency isn't great for everybody, and how cosmic rays cause software errors. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, November 7th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From the far too warm New York City, I'm Ayaz Akhtar. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, my friends, uh, we are going to solve the mysteries of the universe and why your software just suddenly makes weird things happen. But first, the quick hits. Apple announced it anticipates shipping fewer iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max units due to COVID-19 restrictions at the primary Foxconn factory in Zhengzhou, China. China ordered a one-week lockdown in the area starting November 2nd. Apple says the factory, where many iPhones are assembled, quote, is currently operating at significantly reduced capacity, end quote. Apple advises that customers will experience longer wait times to receive their new products. Shipping is now estimated to take three to four weeks from order. Over the weekend, several people noticed the Twitter app update notes indicating that the revised version of Twitter's Blue subscription service had launched for $7.99 a month and included verification. However, product manager Esther Crawford from Twitter noted on Twitter, the new Blue isn't live yet. The sprint to our launch continues, but some folks may see us making updates because we are testing and pushing changes in real time. So you could never actually subscribe to it. Uh, She continued, the Twitter team is legendary. Salute emoji. New blue coming soon. So. No new Twitter blue just yet, but uh, sounds like you might get it by the end of the week. In other Twitter news, Elon Musk said that any Twitter handles engaging in impersonation without clearly specifying parody will be permanently suspended. Previously, Twitter issued a warning before such suspensions. China's second biggest chip manufacturer, Hua Hong Semiconductor, received regulatory approval for an initial public offering on Shanghai's star market, hoping to raise 18 million yuan in the next offering, which is about 2.5 billion U.S. dollars, which will be used to invest in a new chip fab and upgrade an existing one, both in the city of Wuxia. Trendforce estimates the company holds a 3.2 percent market share in the global foundry market, making most of its revenue on mature technology, mostly based on on a five nano, 55 rather nanometer process. Now that star market is a stock market in Shanghai, very different than the one you find on the hub in the Causeway in Boston. Totally different yep. star markets. Yep. Uh, LiDAR is a key technology used in autonomous driving. Over the years, many LiDAR startups come onto the market to try to get a piece of the driver assistance pie. Now we're seeing the industry consolidate. Uh, two LiDAR companies, Ouster and Velodyne, have agreed to merge, according to a November 4th agreement. Neither company has been able to turn a profit, but they hope that by combining their not profit, they can create scale to drive profitable and sustainable revenue growth. Over the last year, both companies acquired other LiDAR startups. Ouster acquired Sense Photonics in 2021, and earlier this year, Velodyne acquired Blue City AI. Messaging app Telegram added video messaging transcription now available to its Telegram premium users. Free users also get new features. Uh, Topics and groups will let groups with over 200 members create separate spaces that work like individual chats with discrete notifications. It also added collectible usernames, which can be purchased and sold, secured on the TON, T-O-N, blockchain. They can be fewer than five characters long and function like regular usernames and search and links. In other encrypted messaging news, Signal also added a feature that many (laughs) are delighted by, but some annoyed by. It added the ability to share ephemeral messages, videos, and text. They expire in 24 hours, kind of how ephemeral messaging works on other platforms. Something that Signal is very creatively calling Signal Stories. It's available on iOS and Android now and coming to the desktop soon. Now, don't worry. If you're not into it, you can turn off viewing stories in your settings. Yeah, but, you know, give it a shot. Let's see what people do. Encrypted. And that's the quick hits. All right. Uh, Apple's doing something that may or may not be a good idea. Yeah. So Apple historically arrives a little later to a certain type of technology, making up being late to market with its own polish within an emerging category. You could think of the iPod, not the first MP3 player, 
iPhone wasn't the first smartphone, but Apple was uncharacteristically early when it came to virtual assistants on smart devices. Siri came out in 2011 with the iPhone 4S, three years ahead of Amazon's voice assistant, and certainly there have been others since then. Being so early, however, its wake word set the tone for the industry with the hey wake word, in this case Siri, approach being used by Microsoft's and Google's assistants as well. Samsung broke the mold with their daring high Bixby implementation. Mm. That was wild. But now Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports that Apple began an initiative to change the wake word for its smart assistant to just calling out Siri, dropping the need to say hey before the name. Gurman describes this as a technical challenge that required a lot of AI training and underlying engineering work. The new wake word approach is in testing with employees to gather training data. The company reportedly plans to roll out the switch early next year, but Gurman says this could also slip into 2024. Yeah, this also comes as Apple plans to integrate Siri more deeply into third-party apps. The idea being to improve the ways that Siri can understand a variety of requests and perform a correct course of action if it can connect deeper into Apple's app ecosystem. Now, we will get to the, the technical challenge because I think that's interesting here. But the first reaction I had when I heard this story was my Siri has been going off accidentally more often lately. And I feel like dropping the hey part would make it go off even more, right? Like, mm -hmm. hey, mm -hmm. Siri is a lot easier, is a lot harder to accidentally say than just Siri, as witnessed by the fact that we never say I'll exa all in one go because we don't want to set off everyone's Amazon Echoes who's listening to us. I've gotten a lot of false uh, reactions from my iPad when I would just say the word serious. So I'm not even saying, hey, anything. And I, would, I would try to look at my script and I'm saying, what am I saying that's close? Serious. So if Apple's going to do this and they figure out a way to ha have their, uh, their machines understand what, what word you're actually saying, that'd be a great improvement. But if this gets any worse, I mean, that would be, I think, a real problem because Siri is still collectively thought of as... I wouldn't say it's as big of a joke as Bixby, but it's way behind considering how f how much Google and Amazon have like leapfrogged them. I mean, it, I don't know. I think it's gotten a lot better um, it, since its early days uh, back before there were really uh, voice assistants in general. I definitely set off my Amazon assistant for all sorts of reasons. In fact, sometimes it happens during the show where I'm like, I didn't say anything that even started with the letter A. Like, what are you doing? Um, my mom, when I was visiting her uh, recently, she's got an Apple Watch, and you know, we were talking amongst ourselves, and her phone or her her watch kept going off because we were triggering that somehow, and we just kept laughing and not really understanding what was going on. Uh, I think that that. You know, that is sometimes a ha-ha situation, sometimes an annoyance, and sometimes worse. You know, when yeah. you actually trigger something where you're like, oh, man, this has got to stop. You know, where where can I give more input on the fact that whatever I said, the next time I say that, do not do this again. And I think that's, wh that's where I would like to see a little bit more, uh, you know, um, some, you know, programming efforts uh, because right now it's like you just get kind of annoyed and stay quiet for a second and then everything goes off and your life continues. Yeah, and, and the, I'm willing to entertain the possibility that reducing it to Siri and all the work they're doing to make that work will actually be a net improvement. Uh, yeah. That they're they're going to hone in on that and make it only uh, active when you really do say Siri. Because, yeah, I mean, how many times have I said, hey, Sarah, and then Quite a few. complained that Siri not only launched, but transcribed me saying, hey, Sarah. Like, right, yeah. like, like it knew I said Sarah somehow, but then also thought I said like, Siri. Like, I'm yeah. on board. Because it's two different <laughs> systems going, right? Yeah. And one was apparently better than the other. I mean, this means that there's a lot more advancements in their chips and their actual machine learning uh, technologies. Because if the HomePod gets smarter, if the watch is smarter, if everything's getting smarter, that means these chips are getting more and more like just great. So that's yeah, yeah. the thing about the technical side on it. That also kind of it kind of speaks to the fact that you know when I first saw like maybe this wouldn't roll out until 2024, I was like, really? I mean, how hard is it? Clearly, there's more going on besides just saying, "Oh, let's delete the word hey." <laughs> and it's now it just all works it work the same badly. Way. They just, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's, it's hard to make it work well. Uh, well, this this is an error that we kind of know why it happens. Have you ever had a weird computer error and thought that the only explanation could be ghosts or maybe cosmic rays? Well. 
there may be something to that second one. Chris Baraniak wrote an article for BBC Future last month called The Computer Errors from Outer Space. Uh, his article started with a story about a security researcher named Marie Mo, whose pacemaker suffered a glitch because of some oddly corrupted data that she believed was probably corrupted by cosmic rays when she was in an airplane. Now, that may sound far out, but particles from the sun and elsewhere in the universe constantly rain down on Earth. Some of them, like neutrinos, pass right through everything without incident. Some, like photons, provide life-giving energy to plants and animals. And some, like stray protons or neutrons, may, in rare cases, cause what's called a single event upset. These are radiation-induced soft errors caused by the impact of energetic <clears throat> excuse me, caused by the energetic particles on circuits. One example would be an errant neutron passes through a chip and disrupts the electrical charge to flip a one to a zero. Flipped bits were diagnosed as the cause of Moe's pacemaker issue, though whether they were flipped by cosmic rays or not is impossible to tell. Yeah, it's hard to prove. Uh, single event upsets are exceedingly rare and they don't leave a trace. An error caused by an errant cosmic ray is indistinguishable from just a software glitch or a memory bug or normal wear and tear on, on an old piece of equipment. And even if you can distinguish particle-induced effects, they are so rare, it would be hard to get a representative sample size to do any kind of significant study. One of the largest samples collected is from Mozilla, whose engineer Travis Long noted back in April this year that it routinely sees unexplained errors in telemetry data that correspond to flipped bits. They can tell that it's flipped bits. And Long noted that a recent bug associated with such errors correlated with a geomagnetic storm. There was also a study of satellites published in 2020 that showed that data errors in orbiting satellites happened in much larger numbers when satellites pass through something called the South Atlantic Anomaly, where there is increased cosmic radiation. Now, these are correlative, though, not causative. While it's hard to prove if it did happen, you can prove that it's possible. Paolo Reck at Trento University in Italy has conducted lab experiments where they fired neutrons at electronics and induced errors. They're using the data to develop improved autonomous car algorithms to be able to detect and adapt to such errors. Yeah, you can use the particles to create an error. You just can't prove if a particular error was because of a particle, I guess, unless you were the one shooting the particle at it. Uh, so what can you do with this information? On the one hand, be aware because the occurrence may be increasing. There are so many more chips being used at any given moment that there is just more of a chance for it to happen because there's, there's more chances out there. There's more chips, therefore more chances. And as chips are getting smaller, you know, we're talking about one and two nanometer processes, it's easier for subatomic particles to affect them because the particles are the same size. Uh, you also might check space weather. Periods of increased solar activity raise the amount of particles hitting the Earth. For instance, spaceweather.com reported a solar flare on November 7th that interrupted shortwave radio temporarily over Australia and New Zealand. But the number of incidents is still exceedingly rare and almost always is compensated for by error checking in software. Data centers can protect themselves by being geographically diverse and critical equipment like computers in air and spacecraft are hardened against interference. Yeah, one of the things I found interesting about this, uh, looking into this story, was that those hardened equipment are protected by a bunch of proprietary uh, protections. So you don't know how they're protecting them. It, it, those are kind of trade secrets. Uh, so it, it'd be really hard and probably expensive to do this on your own, which is why they say, you know, for a data center, just, just make sure you've got data centers in multiple places if you're a big company like that. Reading articles about this and seeing that, that they're using this for cars and their ability to essentially identify whether they're seeing an object or a person or not, if a flip bit could cause that kind of uh, scary confusion for a computer, that would be like a terrifying like real life example since this self-driving car thing is supposed to be happening, not happening. Yeah. You guys have been covering that for a long yeah. time. Yeah. So uh, the, in the real world stuff, hopefully that those those applications are hardened very, very much to avoid any kind of catastrophes. Or, or if the, not, if the not hardened, at least error corrected, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. These, the, the, the car example is one of those stories where it's like, you just need one, one story of people saying, ever heard of flip bits, cosmic events? 
well, you know, say goodbye to smart cars that can drive themselves because, you know, they're, they're, they're not safe after all and people will freak out. Um, and maybe some, at some times this is warranted, but I think from what both of you just laid out, pretty exceedingly rare. And the fact that it is a known phenomenon uh, that is sometimes real and can be, be, at least be researched, if not mitigated uh, right away, is 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 the first step. Yeah, and and usually a flipped bit doesn't cause a catastrophic error. Uh, certainly in a complex system like a car, it would be exceedingly rare for that to happen. Even in in Mo, uh, with the 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 pacemaker that we that they use as an example of the BBC story, the pacemaker just reset to default when that happened. It wasn't like it stopped altogether, but she noticed she's like, this isn't the way it usually feels. And, uh, and, and so got it looked at. Uh, so yeah, you usually a flipped bit doesn't cause catastrophic errors and they're rare, but interesting to know that that's real. Cause I I've often, I've often thought about that. I've and Larry and Alana was joking. It's like, Oh, now when I make a coding error, I can just blame it on cosmic rays. Uh, it, it is a real thing. Well, folks, uh, it's time to get our holiday gift card list in order. It is that time of year. Each year, we send every patron who wants one a holiday gift card with exclusive art from Len Peralta. We've seen what he's done this year, and it's very nice. We hope it will inspire joy in your home as well. If you'd like the card, make sure you're a patron, first of all, and then check patreon.com slash pledges to make sure that we have your proper mailing address if you want something sent to you. If not, no worries. But if you do, do that by November 15th, please, and get the exclusive DNS holiday card, DTNS holiday card, mailed to you from us. DNS, that's something Yeah, we need, your, we need your actual mailing address, not your DNS. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> yes. Cosmic rays need not apply. When browsing listings on Airbnb, potential guests can sometimes be hit with a little sticker shock. That's because the service shows the nightly rate for a booking, but does not show required fees that might go along with it. Things like security deposits, cleaning fees, uh, even extra fees like for pets or peated pools, for example. So that cute little vacation rental might not be quite as much of a steal as it appeared to be at first blush. CEO Brian Chesky has announced that Airbnb is making changes to make pricing more transparent. Yeah, specifically starting in December, Airbnb will now let customers set a toggle switch to show the total cost of stays when they're just browsing around. That includes fees rather than just the nightly fee, which is how it's always worked in the past. Though it still won't include taxes. When you check out, you're still going to be paying a little bit more, but many people are used to that buying things online in general. Uh, so uh, the pricing will show across the app, including in search, in maps, and also wish lists, as long as the user stays logged in. If they log out, they would have to choose the selection again when they log back in. The service will also factor in the total cost of stays more heavily in search results, regardless of whether or not users toggle on total cost. Now, additionally, in the coming months, the platform is going to roll out more discount tools for hosts, uh, letting them set seasonal or weekend discount pricing. And any host checkout requests will be shown to guests before they book. You probably, as a person who rents places, like all of these changes, right? You want to see the actual cost of what you're booking. You want to see the checkout requests. Like, am I going to have to like change the sheets and throw them in the dryer or something before? It's good to know that before you book. Uh, but Sarah, you actually manage an Airbnb, and some of these are good and some of these are not from your end of what happens, right? 100%. So as somebody uh, who is potentially going to put down some coin, you know, maybe with my family to stay at a vacation rental. You know, the vacation rental that I manage is quite large. You know, there's a big pool and a and a hot tub and two separate kitchens and quite a few bedrooms. It's it is a it is a place that a large family typically books for around a week to stay at. That adds up, uh, especially in high season where our rates go up a little bit, which is a separate conversation. But uh, you know. When you look at a nightly price, let's say something is eight hundred dollars a night, and you think, well, you know, let me, you know, we're all going to be able to stay together, be able to cook food in the house. It's going to be more fun. If you break that down, a hotel would be so much more expensive, and we all wouldn't be kind of in this nice homey atmosphere. Makes a lot of sense. 
Sometimes when you look at that week total with the cleaning fee that always, you know, is added on, plus, you know, various taxes, and yes, sometimes an extra service fee if they want to heat the pool in the winter, for example. That costs us money, so it costs them money. And that can all lead to people saying, well, hold on a second, like, this is insane. Is it, does it really cost this much? And the thing is, is like, yeah, it's going to cost that much either way. But you might as well know that ahead of time so that I don't have to have that uncomfortable conversation with you afterwards. And I think that property managers slash owners of any vacation rental knows how this works, where you, you, know, you have people kind of wanting to go through and itemize stuff later on where you think, but that's the whole reason we were on this platform, so that we didn't have to have this conversation. It was all just sort of taken care of yeah, for yeah. us. And that's why Airbnb is taking a fee. You know, they take a cut of all of this. Uh, from from the, the booker and the person who's who's collecting the money, who is offering a house. So, I think these changes are really good. But I have already seen some property management uh, pushback on the saying, "Well, now we have to lower our prices because the sticker shock is going to put more people off ahead of time." I don't really, you know, I, I'm not sure. I think maybe we all just sort of get used to it. Well, yeah, if everybody on the platform is showing their fees, then the only ones that would have sticker shock is if your cleaning fees are significantly greater, I think. Right. It, it, is, it is a song and dance, though. It really is. Um, one of the other things that you mentioned, Tom, of the platform rolling out uh, more discount, discount tools for hosts um, and being able to set seasonal... Or, you know, higher pricing, depending on, you know, for example, we don't have anybody booked here for Christmas. Uh, and Christmas is historically like, you know, it's a pretty big week. Mm -hmm. You know, people, High demand. Yeah. yeah, high demand. And, you know, a lot of people just aren't traveling. Maybe they're saving some cash. Maybe they've already done another trip earlier in the year. You know, it happens in a <laughs> looming recession type of thing. But, uh, but that kind of thing would be pretty great. Because right now, if I want to set 2023 pricing... It is a manual process where I go through and methodically. Each day. Every day. Ugh, you can yeah. say Airbnb just kind of like give me w what you think that pricing for stuff in my general area for the same kind of place is going for and just hands off. But they're not they're not going to. Um, they're not going to... They're not going to adjust it for the weekends or for the seasons, right? Yeah. Or if you know, like, 4th of July is like a slam dunk right. for us. Like we You're going to have we to can... go and do that manually. Yeah. Exactly. And so that would that would be nice. But uh, I, you know, again, I, as a Airbnb user on both sides, I've I've stayed at lots of Airbnbs as a, as a guest uh, over the years with mixed results. But that's sort of sort of the beauty of it. How I much guess. are these cleaning fees anyway, though? Like getting back to the to the fee thing. Like I I know, I know the weekend tools makes it easier on your end, but but I mean, is it really raising the the end price that much? Not really, in my opinion. If you're paying five grand for a week stay and the cleaning fee is three hundred dollars, you know, you figure like, I mean, what are they paying the cleaner? Probably right. around three hundred dollars. You know, it's like this is not some sort of a money making grab. Yeah, as a percentage of what is being yeah. paid already. But yeah. it does add to the like feeling that you've been nickeled mm -hmm. and dimed. Yeah, and yeah. and I get that. I definitely get that. Well, and if you're looking at a hotel rate, the hotel's gonna hide any of its like resort fees and stuff too. So then it's not apples to apples anymore. I get that too. I mean, the nice thing about a hotel though is that you go, Ooh, we've splurged, right? And like everything is I mean, sure, if you get room service or something, that's going to be an add-on, but that is all kind of hidden in the cost. So it might hurt up front, but it hurts less later. And I think that's what Airbnb is going for. Oh, no, I'm saying like hotels do the fee thing too, where you're like, wait, it was only 400 a night, but it ended up being 500 a night because they had a resort fee and a parking fee. And, oh. you know, they, they pile sure. on the fees after the fact too. Yeah, well, you know, it's a feed happy world. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, well. Uh, fees aside, if you've ever listened to a deep philosophical conversation and been disappointed that it was too coherent and also just didn't go on indefinitely, <laughs> well, then you might like to check out a new website from the Italian artist and programmer Giacomo Maselli called The Infinite Conversation, featuring an AI-powered chat between virtual avatars of the very real German director Werner Herzog and the Slovenian philosopher Slavog Zizek. 
Maselli used a popular language model tuned on interviews and content from both of the speakers and then used AI voice generation to imitate how they would be speaking the dialogue. A new segment is added in daily, so it kind of does go on forever. Maselli notes, new segments can be generated at a faster speed than what it takes to listen to them. In theory, this conversation could continue until the end of time. The site is meant to be a commentary on the social impact of audio deepfakes. This is the best ever. <laughs> oh, I mean, just proof of concept, right? Like, okay. I've got my immediate the conversation cynicism. that will never end. Immediate cynicism of like, how long before it devolves into some like terrible conversation about like, I don't know. Uh, let's talk about. You know how those AI bots that Microsoft tried to come up with and they're like, they turned into like racist really fast or like sexist really fast. Like when does this break down? I don't want an infinite conversation where that happens. So I don't know what kind of moderation is happening with, with yeah. these AI yes. folks, but yet. it's something. We are too early. That was them. You are asking about the future. I think that maybe my version of materialism will be our centrist version of Kantian idealism. It was very important. I think your I think your fears are relaxed, Ayaz, because it's trained specifically on Herzog and Zizek. It probably is more repetitive than it is yeah. off the rails. Okay, that's good then. Rails are good for some for some of the stuff. It's not trained on the wide open internet, right? So there's there's some there's some rails around. Like Nazism or Stalinism, a palpable experience of how not only God dies, but also humanity itself dies. I feel like this would be soothing to me at night. <laughs> like yeah. I, could, I could kind of be like, I'm kind of tired, but I want to listen to something for a little bit. How about the infinite conversation? <laughs> and it just keeps going and going. And it just keeps going. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, something else that keeps going, thanks to you, is email feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. What do we have in the mailbag? Uh, this one comes from Carlene. Carlene is talking uh, in reference to our conversation last week about Amazon's changes to Prime Music. Amazon said, hey, we're adding a bunch of new stuff for you. Carlene says, to me, they've taken away a cool small feature and replaced it with an upsell I'll never use. Like Rich, I have kids that loved asking Amazon's assistant, we'll call her A, to play a song. When we experienced the change the other night, my three-year-old couldn't understand why A wouldn't play Baba Black Sheep over and over. Mm. My older kids had a To Go Sleep playlist that's now shuffled with similar songs. When you're particular about something as a kid, that does not work well. Carlene says, we loved having a specific song or playlist on demand played through A, but now it's just frustrating. I've been deep into the Echo ecosystem, but its lack of a straightforward way to connect with YouTube music and now this really makes me consider switching to Google Home. Well, if you're in the YouTube music system, I guess that makes sense. Uh, I have always had the Echo connected to Spotify and Apple Music, so we've never really relied on Amazon Music. But that said, I totally get it, Carlene, where your kids are like, no, but it always works this way. And you're like, well, I don't want to have to pay extra to make it work for my kids that way. Yeah, that line about shuffled with similar songs would be maddening for yeah. like adults, let alone children. I just think that's 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 kind of a horrible little switch. I've also I've used Echoes for a long time. I don't use their music service. Use YouTube music. It works all right. As long as your playlists are your playlists, but that that allows you to like at least upload your stuff. I'm, I've had substitutions happen where I had a track of a song that I liked that was on their service, and then it got switched for like a live version because they had the rights to that. Mm. That is horrible. What <laughs> it sounds similar I to mean, this and, mess. And there, there is a solution, which is pay eight ninety nine a month. That's what Amazon's saying. Like you, you want these features that you came to rely on? Well, you have to pay for them now. What is this? A verified check mark? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it's Come a dollar on. more than a verified check mark. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I have the solution. When the kids get upset that they can't play Ba Ba Black Sheep, just put on Infinite this. Conversation. I could never That's direct right. a film liking Bob Bergman's The Serpent's Egg. What's not to like? The yeah, the kids you know? will go right to sleep. That's right. It's true. <laughs> well, you know who doesn't put us to sleep is Ayaz Akhtar because he always makes the show better. Ayaz, yes. what have you been up to lately? I've been working on This Old Nerd. Uh, that's a show where we show you have, how to have the most tech-forward home and life as possible in as little time as you need. Because the thing is, we've got a lot of responsibilities as adults or older people, and you might want to take care of them. So, like, the projects are quick, and they're simple. And I'm just thinking not right now, like, how I would come up, roll my own solution to not have to pay Amazon to do this, create my own playlists, make sure they're available on all the Echoes. 
I sure, I'm pretty sure there's a way to roll your own using like Plex. I got to think about that. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff we do. Fantastic. Uh, also want to thank our brand new bosses, Anastasia and Aaron, who just started backing us on Patreon. Hey. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Aaron, for finding the value in independent tech journalism. If you're out there listening and you're getting some value out of us and you can afford, we know not everybody can right now, but if you can afford to pick everybody else up and give a little value back, please do. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Indeed. Speaking of patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We roll right into it when DTNS wraps up. But just a reminder, you can catch the show Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2100 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back talking about YouTube shorts tomorrow with Lamar Wilson. He has thoughts. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Material, listen, that works.